Well, hey everyone, excited to uh, be tuning in with a special guest today. Um, um, this is Andrew or AJ, I guess, as you, as you go by. Uh, AJ, would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself, what you do? Uh, I go by AJ. I'm a clinical substance abuse counselor, a licensed professional counselor, uh, independent clinical supervisor, and I also do international certified gambling. So basically a lot of my background is in substance use and addictive behaviors, but also mental health as well. I do clinical supervision at a Waukesha comprehensive treatment program that focuses on individuals with opioid use, you know, like heroin, prescription pain meds. I also do counseling at New Life Resources, where I do a lot of individual work, couples, families with substance use and mental health. And I also host a podcast called Talking Addiction and Recovery. All that combined, I've been doing this now for 16 years of addiction counseling work. Wow, that's, that's really incredible. I know um, for my, um, a lot of family members that I've known personally um, have really struggled with a lot of these things. And so let me first off just say, hey, thank you so much for, for all the work that you do um, and the impact that you make, because I know it really, it really does, um, really does change lives. And so thank you. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for all your effort. And just, I think from what I've heard already, just your desire for more people to, to hear about and how they can battle and fight through addiction. So thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. Um, well, we started, uh, curious, how do you, or have maybe those in your profession, how do you define addiction? It's a, it's a very interesting question because, you know, throughout, you know, the years and, and how we've looked at it and understood it and studied it, there's so much complexity to it. But when you kind of break it down to the core of it, of what separates someone who has like an addiction versus someone who has an issue with it, or maybe they are social users, is that someone with an addiction uses a substance or engages in a behavior that it becomes compulsive to the point where they continue to do it despite some of the harmful consequences that are happening. So this is causing me harm and I can't stop that. Um, I imagine that probably affects people's life just tremendously as we, as we know. Um, how have you seen it affect someone's life? I mean, everywhere. I mean, from you know the little bit of things, you know, seeing it from when it's first starting, you know, I worked a lot with teenagers um, and adolescents when I first got into this field. So when you work with individuals as young as 12, 13, you don't necessarily look at them as having an addiction. They might be just getting started with their using and they're experimenting, they're, they're using with peers. And I've seen it all the way from that stage to, you know, doing this for so long the, the amount of people I've known who have overdosed and, and experienced fatal consequences of it, it has, has grown. So all that in between, you know, there, there's not many ways where I haven't seen it impact someone's life from, you know, family to, to job to finances to really, you know, wreak havoc in any kind of area it can. It's really all encompassing. You mentioned uh, the seeing it in in teenagers and students as young as 12 and 13, uh, is there something different when it comes to um, how you would go about helping someone of that age versus maybe someone who's a little bit older? Yeah, the younger age is always tougher because the back in the day, the way drugs, you know, drug prevention was kind of focused on was if you use, you're going to end up in jail, you're going to end up dead. Uh, they, they really laid the heavy consequences and those, those do happen. However, there's a lot of times where people use the very first time and the consequences don't just fall on them. You know, they don't get arrested the very first time. They don't end up in an ambulance in, in, in a hospital, but and because of that, it starts to develop that I can get away with it and I'm different that invincibility that we see develop in, in that teenage, younger adolescent years. So when it doesn't happen right away, it already kind of sets that tone that like, you know, I'm different, it's not gonna happen to me. And that, that's challenging because you don't see that right away. But then when you start working with adults, 
you're like, these are some of the very same kids I'm, I was trying to work with to prevent them from ending up in jail, in hospitals, and having friends and stuff that are, you know, that have overdosed themselves have overdosed. You try to prevent that from happening, then you see it where this is where you are, where I didn't want you to be. Yeah. Wow. Uh, just, to, just to highlight that just for a second, I know it's a little bit um, narrowing in on a specific thing. Is there something that maybe a parent or someone can do? They find a first use, maybe a second use, they discover this. Is there anything they can do right away to maybe help prevent that habit from forming? Yeah, you just have to be able to talk about it. And that's, as a counselor, that's why I find it the most beneficial is having hard conversations about finding it and, and talking about it. And I've seen it happen over the year where a parent has, or a friend has neglected it, said it's no big deal. Maybe they don't really want to face it, so they avoid it. There's been times where I know parents and, and friends and all that have said it's no big deal. Like we all do that. I've done that before too, but we never know where that's going to end up. You know, for some people that that first time using might end up being they'll never use again. But for that same person, this might end up being something that will then take over their life. Mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily know who that's going to be. So I always say you just have to have those conversations. You have to have talks about it. There's a great book out there called Hi. And it was written by David and Nick Sheff. And their history is amazing, but it's a father-son who the, the son had an addiction and the dad, they both wrote stories about what it was like in their shoes. And they combined and wrote a book together that is used for parents to talk to their kids about drugs. It was actually written for like a fourth or fifth grade reading level, but it's supposed to be, how do you have these conversations with, with kids or, or your children when you do catch them using because nowadays with social media and technology, they're either going to, I tell us the parents all the time, you, they're either going to find out through their friends and social media, or they can find out through you. The option of they're not going to find out is really not around. So mm. if they're going to know about it, who would you rather have it be talked to from? And yeah. hopefully parents look at it as that they can be the ones to educate, to have those conversations because they're going to get it from somewhere else. Right. Being able to start the conversation early enough to, so they're speaking into the situation rather than relying on their education coming from someone else. That makes a lot yeah, of sense. Yeah, or somewhere else. And, and, and the yeah. younger it is too, you got to have it younger. I mean, back then learning about it, the age of initial use is, in, is getting lower. So you have kids who are using now you know, nine, 10 years old, and they're learning more about it at a younger age. And that wasn't happening as much before. So now it needs to get that education out there a lot earlier, have those conversations, not when someone's 18 or 19, mm -hmm. but a lot younger is when they're going to find out about drugs and alcohol and all this kind of stuff through social media and other technologies. That's really good. Is there a recommended age that you would uh, say, wow, I want to make sure that my child or my student has heard about these things from me by this point? I mean, I think one indicator is if if the person has, seems to have an issue, like they've mentioned it, they've talked about it, they've asked about it, like that's a sign to, hey, let's, let's have a conversation because they're wondering about it or they're thinking about it. But another thing is if you're paying attention to like, who they're connecting with, who they spend time with, what are they looking at? What are, what are the, the music that they're listening to? What is it that the movies that they're watching? If those things have references and are showing that, they're already gonna start to get some kind of idea of what is this? Is this something that's cool to do? Is this something that I should like? That's already gonna start to develop. So once they start to see that and be aware of it, is a time to have that conversation. There is nothing that ever shows that talking to someone about drug use or talking to someone about this like increases their likelihood of doing it. Like mm -hmm. having conversations doesn't mean now I'm gonna go do this because we talked about it. So really a young age is really ideal. We got really specific on maybe teenage use with, with drug use there. 
if we were to take a broader look, maybe it, it, there's lots of different forms of addiction. Um, what would be some signs um, that maybe you could rec- that someone would recognize in themselves or someone might recognize in a loved one that hinted at they were addicted to something? Yeah, the, the, everyone wants to like ask a lot of those questions about how do I know if someone's got a problem? We've seen that increase too with like teaching classmates to recognize maybe if one of your fellow classmates has an issue with something. Identifying an addiction can be really difficult to do without that professional lens and that professional experience and that that diagnostic criteria that we use. So I really educate people on just paying attention to signs that like someone is likely using something or engaging in a behavior. And what they're doing is either causing problems, but in a real general sense, I use this phrase a lot is, you know, that's not normal. You know, like we we know people who might drink casually, but there's someone that you might know that when you think about their drinking, like that's not normal. That's not what casual people do. So when you look at it, there's a bunch of different things to pick apart. You know, when it comes to difficulties with school or someone with work, when there's attendance issues, behavioral problems, performance things, like when things start to decline from what they normally do, that might be a red flag that something's going on with their life. You know, all of a sudden, if they're not engaging in the same interests as they did before, that's a big one I give for Um, parents, if this kid really liked to do this a lot, and all of a sudden they don't seem to be doing it at all, they're, they're, they're not doing it that often, they just dropped it entirely. When they give up something that they used to really enjoy, there's, there's something going on there. Usually that's happening. Um, I'm big on physical appearance. You know, if, if they don't seem like their normal self, if they look a certain way, if their weight fluctuation is a big one, family members notice that right away too. They'll always tell me when someone gets sober for a while, they say, well, they look more full in their face. They have more color to their skin. Mm. Like, all that kind of stuff doesn't give you a uh, clear answer that this person has like an addiction, but it just tells you that they're using or they're engaging in a behavior is starting to really impact their life. So this isn't just social normal use. This is starting to actually make changes with them. Like financials is a big one to pay attention to. Um, You know, there's there's so many things that are just kind of slight changes that you really can pick up on that just tells you something's going on here. Mm. Is is there anything, say, an individual could maybe ask themselves, maybe not so much as they, uh, because you have a lot of really good stuff about um, I mean, someone you know might be struggling with it, uh, but I'm sure the people watching it right now, maybe they have a tendency or a habit that they're telling themselves, you know, it's not a, it's not a big deal, it's fine, it's whatever. What would be some things that maybe they could ask themselves or some, some uh, litmus test maybe that they were actually suffering from an addiction? Yeah, one of the big things, and this is great that you're asking this, is because there's part of in that treatment recovery, we look at how someone's life has become unmanageable because of their drug use or alcohol use. Like, and a lot of people will argue that I don't have that problem because I work and I do this and I do that. So my life isn't unmanageable, but there's a flip side to that. And this is what I use a lot with people who are um, alcohol drinkers, who are um, marijuana smokers, you know, I say, okay, like your life hasn't become unmanageable. Can you manage without? And that kind of gets them stuck in their tracks a little bit because the idea is if I took this away from you and you couldn't use it, how would you be? And for some people who are using every day or who are using quite often, Maybe they don't look at their life as unmanageable, but they would have a really hard time managing without it because they have grown into a dependency for that. Does that make Mm. sense? Yeah, that does. That's really interesting. That's a great question. Um, So you talked a lot about um, 
you know, you've, you've been doing this for a long time, right? And um, I'm sure you hear things, maybe it's on TV, maybe it's from conversations you overhear, or conversations with loved ones, where you maybe hear them say something or mention something about addiction. And you're like, oh, you know what? That's not, that's not <laughs> quite right. Um, maybe some common misconceptions that you've heard that would be awesome for, for uh, people who are watching to hear or yeah, yeah. Just rethink through. Yeah, it's it's a amazing point because as I I see things happen and you know you see right now with it take like movies and television you see addiction being put in a lot of storylines more than normal so they're trying to make it where like let's talk about addiction and let's show what kind of happens and then all of a sudden I'll see a scene where they go to treatment or they go to like a meeting and some drama unfolds and, and right away I'm like that's that's not how it works so you're portraying it but you're not portraying it accurately and the the problem with that and there's two examples I can really think of that I think is important to share here but overall there is so much stigmas and misinformation about addiction about mental health about counseling about therapy about treatment this last year alone I presented about four or five times on stigmas related to those issues in general. Like I have to talk to people about stigmas about just going to counseling because there's a bunch that are even related to that. So it's important to look at those entirely. When it comes to substance use, I think the, the two really important ones for family members, loved ones, someone who's thinking about their using or questioning it is the concept of rock bottom is a common phrase you hear in that. And I think I get scared with that because I think a lot of people are hopeful that if someone hits their rock bottom, like it can't get any worse. Like, oh, they're at their rock bottom. Things can only look up from here. If, if there's anything that I know is addiction knows how to build bottoms and knows how to, to build basements. You know, I've had people who winding up in the hospital was my rock bottom. Then they've wound up in the hospital 10 more times or someone has experienced a fatal overdose. I know someone who $10,000 in debt was a rock bottom actually ended up owing $90,000 in debt at one point. So I think family members and sometimes an individual believes that a rock bottom is like a sign of relief that things can get better now, but that's not a guarantee. And I had a really good discussion with an author about this is that you don't have to wait for a rock bottom to happen to make change. You don't have to wait to get a DUI to decide to cut back or stop your drinking. You don't have to wait until you are in a hospital bed to realize I should stop my drug use. You don't have to hit a rock bottom. You can change before that happens. That's so good. I, I love the line, um, people at rock bottom are really good at building basements. Yeah. That's really good. That really highlights that there's, there's always an opportunity for someone to dig deeper. And it really has to be this change where you start to, I guess, seek help really be, be the thing, right? Right, right. And so, make change. Yeah. yeah. Another misconception is if I don't have an addiction, that must mean I don't have a problem. So there's kind of like this idea that either you have, you are an addict and you can't control it. If you're, if you don't have an addiction, then you must be okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There is diagnosing someone with a substance use disorder but there are also different levels of where people are in between, I don't have a problem and I have an addiction. So a lot of my education is along the way, people enter experimenting stages, they enter social using and regular use, they might start to have some problems. And when I assess people professionally, I actually assess where they are with that because I feel people are able to recognize that more that, Hey, you know, you're, you're using socially, you're using regularly. You're telling me you're using every day. That's pretty regular. Wouldn't you say, yeah, that, that is true. Or if they're seeing me for a DUI assessment while well, you're drinking, you know, having a DUI is a, is a 
problem, right? That's not a good thing. Well, yeah, it's, it's a problem. Well, so now it's problem. But once you try and throw out that addiction word, it's, it's very easy for that denial and that defensiveness to come out as a defense mechanism. When someone's on that pathway, you know, you mentioned the, cause you said the stigma around even the word addiction where someone puts up walls and those might, those walls might prevent them from trying to change or seek something. Um, say somebody right now is they're watching and they wouldn't say they have an addiction, but they know that what they're doing isn't, uh, maybe it's not the best version of themselves. Um, what would be some things that maybe you'd say to that individual as they're, as they're um, wrestling with this use of, whether it's alcohol, drugs, pornography, gambling, whatever it is, um, what would you say to them? I usually say, and this is why I love that um, when you look at their stages of using is I, I always say that as you progress through them, you can't go back. So the closer you are to going from that, well, I'm experimenting with it. You can only experiment for so long until it's regular using. Now, now you're just using all the time. You can't tell me you're experimenting when you're using daily. As you push into that problem use and then that addictive use, like you just can't go back to that earlier stage of experimenting. So I, I tell people as kind of like a, call it like a disclaimer, you know, whenever I'm, whenever I'm talking to someone about this, the, the more you progress into this, it's, it's going to be where you can't go back. So right now, if you're at problem using, now's a good time for us to figure out how to address this. And so that it's no longer causing you problems, or you need to make a, a choice to stop so that you're not here. But if you continue to have more and more problems, and this progresses, you are going to likely end up in the addiction stage. Mm -hmm. Once you're there, that's something that for most of us in this profession agree that that's something that is going to be now the rest of your life. You can't go back to, oh, I'm just going to experiment. So I always make that disclaimer when I, when I first talk with people about their using. That's really good. As, as someone's on that, that pathway, um, at what point would you advise them maybe, hey, you should consider seeking treatment? Yeah, when it, when it comes to when I'm in a professional setting, yeah. I, I have that backbone of here's where I am as a professional and I can recommend you need to go here. We need to do this because of where we are. When I talk with family members and friends and even employers sometimes, because as I've worked so much in this field, I also work with a lot of other people, not just the person with the substance use problem. Sure. I tell people that best rule of thumb is if you question your using, if you are thinking whether or not you do too much, or if it's causing some problems, if you think someone else is use is doing that, or it's different than other people's, it's best recommended to go get some help. I think people believe addiction treatment is that means I have to go to detox or that means I have to go to a, a 30, 90 day residential program. You don't have to do that. You can start somewhere to get like an assessment. You can meet with someone like me where we sit down and we talk about it. Then I make my recommendations. I think some people are a little bit hesitant to acknowledge it because they think now I'm going to be in a rehab. I'm going to be in treatment with a bunch of people who have, you know, addiction issues worse than me. And part of it is, is just go, go talk to someone, see a counselor, see a therapist, you know, get a screening done. Let's see where you are to know what we need to do and not automatically think everyone who wants to stop using, it doesn't mean they automatically have an addiction. That's, that's such great advice. Um, I wonder if I could ask you just one more question here. Um, and that, uh, I know it's a little bit off of the questions we talked about before, but um, individuals that um, maybe they're hearing this or, and they're wine, they all of a sudden they wanna quit cold turkey. I know that certain, certain drugs, certain things, um, there's a procedure you need to go through in order to do that in a healthy way. Correct. Um, 
Can you speak into that a little bit? What maybe would be some some things that they should seek uh, medical help before they try to to uh, quit cold turkey? Yeah, alcohol is the main one with really the dependency that happens is you, you want to make sure that you get medical attention if you're going to do some kind of stopping all. And that doesn't mean everyone needs to do that, but there's a concern that if someone is so dependent on alcohol and their body is dependent on it, that withdrawal can actually be fatal for that. Same thing with benzodiazepines, you know, so those are ones that you want to make sure you, you do that. Ones like, you know, the opiates and the opioids, they won't kill you by going through the withdrawal, but the withdrawal is so significant and so painful and so miserable that the person thinks they're going to, which often creates that cycle of using again, that it's really good to go into a facility or a, a place to get that medical viewpoint on what is best for you right now. What are your options? What can we do? If you go and find out and they tell you, you know, we don't have to do anything medical, they're going to let you know that. They're just not going to do that to, to everyone. They're going to do their, their screening, their assessment. They're going to do their stuff to see. But with those three, for sure, it's best to really look at some like medical facility or practice that can make that, that, that determination. And really just going to someone, even a counselor, or a therapist who's got a background in substance use, talking with them and having them tell you, well, hey, you should go here, you should do this. That's why talking to someone is, is very crucial and beneficial. That's really good. Thank you so much. Um, actually, you know, I know I'm, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to ask you one more. Is that, is that okay? Is that <laughs> yeah, okay? that's, that's fine. Uh, just because the conversation made me think about this. Um, say someone has, they're clean. They're, they've been sober for six months, three months, a year, w whatever that is. Um, at that point, uh, I know a big part of recovery is avoiding, avoiding things that um, like are a stimulus to relapse um, or even conversations, I suppose. Is there anything you would tell family members, loved ones about their uh, loved one that has recovered from that addiction that would be helpful for them? And maybe there's not, but I'm just, you know. I mean, there's a lot. The best thing is I've seen a, a big difference when you know we in, in various programs I've worked at we have offered opportunities for parents uh, husbands wives family members to learn about addiction to learn about recovery because there's so much people don't know about it I mentioned before there's so much stigma surrounding them that once they take some time to learn about it they are much better at being able to help and support the person as opposed to trying to do things or doing things they think are helping when they are not understanding that like for example someone getting sober after using for quite a while we talk about how you know how great it's going to be get sober you'll be better things will be great we're going to be happy for you and you're going to be so much when someone stops using right away, those first couple of days aren't fun. They're not enjoyable. They are usually miserable. They are usually really struggling. So being able to educate family members to realize like, yeah, they're going to be struggling when they first stop using. They're not going to be like happy. They're not going to be joyous. Their body's going to be going through some things. Um, they're going to experience cravings even six months out. I mean, you brought that up and it's a great one because someone has a craving six months into their sobriety, a family member might misinterpret that as, oh, they just wanna go use. They just wanna go and get high. And that's not what a craving is. It just means that they are experiencing a desire or urge to use. If they come and talk to you about that, you gotta find a way to support them, not accuse them of, oh, you just wanna go get high again. Is that what this is like? They're not gonna to wanna to share that with you then. So having those conversations, learning about what they're going through, it's one of the reasons why I've really spent time as I've done this more working with a lot of family members. Sometimes people, the person with the addiction doesn't want to see me. <laughs> so then, then who do I have in the office? I have their, their wife or I have their husband or I have their parents. 
Now they're my client. A lot of our work is on how do you have these conversations? What are boundaries? What is enabling? How do you help them? How do you make choices that are, are best for you? How do you practice self-care as a family member? I've done a lot of that more over the years as I've, I've gotten into settings and practices where I can work with family members and not just the person with the addiction. And I am, I'm blown away. This is an amazing conversation. I could ask you so many more questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop <laughs> it there. Um, thank you again. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate this conversation. Really appreciate that desire to really end the stigma around talking around uh, talking about addiction.